are you going to run for president of the United States and do something about it? Do you think she should? Do you think she should? Are you going to run? I have decided to run and will be making a formal announcement within the next week. Whoa. Tulsi Gabbard is running for president. Who is that, you may ask? Well, she's a Democratic congresswoman who represents the second district of Hawaii. She's the first Samoan American and first Hindu member of Congress. She's an Iraq war veteran. And she took a political risk to step down as vice chair of the DNC to endorse Bernie Sanders in his 2016 run for president. I'm endorsing Bernie Sanders because he has that sound judgment and that foresight and that commitment to stopping uh, these interventionist wars of regime change. Probably because of this move, Gabbard is generally referred to as a progressive by both the mainstream media and online. And on numerous issues, she does support progressive policies. She's pro-choice, she opposed TPP, and very crucially for me, supported the restoration of the 1933 Glass-Steagall Act. She's also opposed cuts to Medicare and Social Security, supports universal health care, and protested the Dakota Access Pipeline. But there's more to Tulsi Gabbard than her recent progressive politics. In this video, I will delve into five areas of potential concern for the presidential candidate to give at least a partial answer to this question. Who is she really? For the past seven years or so, Tulsi Gabbard has maintained a generally progressive voting record. But this has not always been the case. Prior to 2012, she had a culturally conservative outlook on a number of issues, but most shockingly right-wing were her views with regards to the LGBT community and gay rights. To begin with, let's be clear about timing. Tulsi Gabbard did not support gay marriage until 2012. That's just three years before same-sex marriage was legalized nationwide. Being against gay marriage in 2012 is kind of like being against interracial marriage in 1964, when Tulsi's mixed-race father was a junior in high school. He also opposed gay marriage, and aggressively so. He founded anti-gay organizations, had an anti-gay radio show, and made a name for himself in the world of politics by successfully amending the Constitution of Hawaii to reserve marriage for opposite gender couples. That was in 1998. Now I personally don't trust any self-proclaimed progressive who ever opposed gay marriage. The reason is, like vice crimes of all sorts, it's a very simple issue to resolve if you believe in personal freedom and are capable of abstract thought. A simple rule that quickly resolves issues like this is John Stuart Mill's harm principle, which states, The only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. In other words, if it doesn't hurt anyone but the person doing it, it shouldn't be illegal. If someone wants to ingest a drug or pay for intimacy or marry someone they love, why should anyone unaffected try to interfere? If you think they should, you're not a progressive. You're also not a liberal or a libertarian. The harm principle doesn't solve all cultural issues. It doesn't solve abortion or gun rights, where people on both sides of the issue are potentially trying to protect the lives and freedoms of people. But you can't simultaneously support the harm principle and oppose equal rights for gay people. Whenever someone does, you tend to find some deep-seated bigotry, and sure enough, Tulsi Gabbard has had some nasty things to say about the LGBTQ community. In 2004, while testifying against a bill aimed at legalizing same-sex civil unions, she said, to try to act as if there is a difference between civil unions and same-sex marriage is dishonest, cowardly, and extremely disrespectful to the people of Hawaii. As Democrats, we should be representing the views of the people, not a small number of homosexual extremists. And that was not the only time she referred to the supporters of gay rights as homosexual extremists. Six months later, she responded to an email sent to her father by Honolulu Magazine, It's clear to me you're acting as a conduit for the Honolulu Weekly and other homosexual extremist supporters of Ed Case. In the same period of her life, Gabbard also worked with an organization called the Alliance for Traditional Marriage, which supported gay conversion therapy and called homosexuality unhealthy, abnormal behavior that should not be promoted or accepted in society. Now, Tulsi would eventually come to renounce her anti-gay activism and apologize to the LGBT community. But with the way she used to talk about gay people and their supporters, it's hard to be confident that she has had a genuine change of mind. There's always the possibility that changes of heart are in actuality, changes only in political posturing. According to reporter Gina Sathian, who profiled Gabbard in 2016, she tells me that, no, her personal views haven't changed, but she doesn't figure it's her job to force her own beliefs on others. 
Gabbard herself has expressed a genuine change of heart on social issues, one that stemmed from her deployment in Iraq. She apparently came to realize that the socially conservative views that she had previously espoused were uncomfortably close to the theocratic paternalism she found to be all too prevalent in much of the Middle East. In 2012, when this apparent change of heart occurred, Gabbard left behind her socially conservative roots and wholeheartedly embraced progressive values. Or at least that's the narrative progressives are to believe. But there are some issues with that story. Long after 2012, for a progressive, she seems to have continued to enjoy some support from pretty questionable characters. One particularly egregious example is David Duke, a white supremacist, white nationalist, Holocaust denier, anti-Semitic conspiracy theorist, convicted felon, former KKK Grand Wizard, failed presidential candidate, and former Republican Louisiana state representative. In November of 2016, David Duke posted an article praising Gabbard on his website and tweeted words of support for the purportedly already progressive congresswoman. Tulsi Gabbard for Secretary of State, an example of the need for political realignment. Thankfully, Gabbard responded to the tweet admonishing the support from one of the world's most preeminent racists. You didn't know I'm Polynesian slash cock? Cajun. Dad couldn't use whites only water film. No thanks. Your white nationalism is pure evil. Tulsi obviously can't be blamed for how she's viewed by infamous people, and she clearly denounced it. One wonders what signals she may have been putting out to cause such a man to endorse her for such a position, but since she rebuked him so clearly, it would be unfair to discredit her over this issue. But Duke isn't the only public figure reviled by progressives who have had nice things to say about Gabbard. Back when he was chief strategist for Donald Trump, Steve Bannon apparently loved Tulsi Gabbard. According to an article from the time in The Hill, he's a big fan of Representative Tulsi Gabbard, the Hawaiian Democrat who frustrates progressives due to her more right-leaning stances on guns, refugees, and Islamic extremism. Bannon even set up talks between Trump and Gabbard shortly after the 2016 election in hopes that she would work with the administration. She didn't end up getting a job in Trump's White House, but there are signs that she kept a sense of allegiance to Bannon. When House Democrats sent a letter to President Trump protesting his decision to hire Bannon, Tulsi Gabbard was not among the 169 lawmakers to sign. Her alignment with Bannon and Trump also goes all the way back to 2015, when she voted in favor of the SAFE Act, which would have made it nearly impossible for Syrian and Iraqi refugees to find safe haven in the US. She also introduced a resolution to prioritize Christian and Yazidi refugees from the region, a move that echoed the religious minority exception Trump put into his original refugee ban. Then there's the Adelsons. You may know Sheldon Adelson as a billionaire casino magnate and one of the biggest donors to GOP politicians. He and his wife Miriam were the biggest contributors to Trump's 2016 campaign and spent tens of millions of dollars in 2012 in a failed attempt to prevent Obama from winning a second term. In 2016, their close friend, Rabbi Shmuley Botiak, awarded Tulsi Gabbard his Champion of Freedom Award. She attended his gala dinner, where she was photographed with the rabbi and Miriam Adelson. Totally coincidentally, I'm sure, back in 2015, Gabbard teamed up with a Republican to reintroduce a bill banning online gambling. This bill was pushed by the Adelsons, no surprise since bans on online gambling are widely regarded to be in the direct financial interest of casino owners like Sheldon Adelson. While her seemingly cozy relationships with decidedly right-wing characters are sure to raise eyebrows amongst progressives, she has other associates that are even more problematic. Just imagine what you would think of a Republican, uh, let's pick one at random, who decided to either personally or through surrogates secretly meet with the leader of an adversary country, all while adopting a political agenda that was strangely favorable to that same adversary. Well, without informing her party's leadership, Gabbard took a trip in January of 2017 to meet with Bashar al-Assad. While she has never been a friend to Syrian refugees, the victims of Assad's conflict with rebel groups of various stripes, her political positions with regards to the bloody civil war has been consistently favorable to Assad through two different American administrations. I feel so strong that we need to end this war to overthrow the Syrian government of Assad now. Now, there is no doubt that it's perfectly acceptable to believe that the U.S. should not be involved in the war in Syria. 
I'm against American intervention in the region. But it's particularly difficult to trust a policy of non-intervention from someone who has personally met with the dictator in secret. Particularly not when Assad is not the only vicious leader that Gabbard has met with. And while she has denounced Assad on multiple occasions, she's lavished praise on other, more than questionable, foreign leaders. According to her own website, Tulsi Gabbard met with Egypt's President al-Sisi in November of 2015. She said of the strongman, President al-Sisi has shown great courage and leadership in taking on this extreme Islamist ideology, while also fighting against ISIS militarily to keep them from gaining a foothold in Egypt. The US must take action to recognize President al-Sisi and his leadership, support Egypt's progress and stability, and stand with him in his fight against ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, and other Islamic extremists who are our common enemy. Her website's press release is still up, and I'll leave a link to it in the description box of this video. It praises al-Sisi for his fight against Islamic extremism, and offered not a single word of critique. According to Human Rights Watch, there are more than a couple of little human rights violations her site might have mentioned. President al-Sisi's government continues to preside over the worst human rights crisis in the country in decades. Police systematically use torture, arbitrary arrests, and enforced disappearances to silence political dissent. Thousands of civilians were tried by military courts. Between Morsi's overthrow in May 2014, Egyptian authorities arrested or charged at least 41,000 people according to one documented count and 26,000 more may have been arrested since the beginning of 2015, lawyers and human rights researchers say. The government itself has admitted to making nearly 34,000 arrests. By introducing new restrictive NGO legislation, detaining journalists, and prosecuting human rights defenders and subjecting them to travel bans, the government is working to eradicate independent civil society in the country. The crackdown on LGBT people has grown increasingly vicious, along with continued repression of labor activists. But Gabbard's relationship with al-Sisi is nothing compared to the friendship she seems to share with the Hindu nationalist leader of India. Prior to becoming the Prime Minister of India, Modi was the Chief Minister of Gujarat. There, in 2002, anti-Muslim riots claimed the lives of more than a thousand people, including 800 Muslims. His state government was widely condemned for passively supporting the violence or at the very least neglecting to do anything effective to protect the Muslim minority. As a result, the US denied him a visa to visit the country in the wake of the violence, and Tulsi Gabbard was among the very few to criticize the US decision, calling it a great blunder. After Modi became Prime Minister of India, the crackdown on religious minorities would continue. Here's what Human Rights Watch has to say about India. Under the ruling BJP government, that's Modi's government, pro-BJP vigilantes have committed violence against religious minorities, marginalized communities, and critics of the government. The failure of authorities to investigate attacks while promoting Hindu supremacy and ultranationalism has further encouraged violence. Supreme Court rulings in 2017 strengthened fundamental rights, equal rights for women, and accountability for security force violations. However, security forces continue to commit arbitrary arrests, torture, and extrajudicial killings with impunity. New laws and policies aimed at justice for sexual violence survivors have not ended barriers in reporting such crimes. Foreign funding regulations are used to target non-governmental organizations critical of the government. Gabbard met with Modi on at least three occasions between 2014 and 2016, twice in the United States and once in India. Upon receiving the invitation to meet with him in his own country, she said, I was delighted to accept the invite of Prime Minister Modi. He is a leader whose example and dedication to the people he serves should be an inspiration to elected officials everywhere. So prior to 2012, Gabbard was an anti-gay activist, but since that time, we are told she has reformed into an ideal progressive. She supported Bernie Sanders and has pushed a wide range of progressive policies, but she's also met with Donald Trump to discuss a possible position in his administration. She's been praised by numerous notorious right-wingers, and she's had absurdly kind words for brutal world leaders. So you'll have to forgive me for asking, who is she really? My function as the chair is to neutrally manage the primary and you know, 
the uh, Congresswoman decided rightfully that if she was no longer able to follow our rules and be neutral, that it was appropriate for her to step down, and that certainly was, uh, you know, was her right to do so.